I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, lessons from uh, building an IPFS an IPLD implementation uh, that is based in WebAssembly. Um, I will be talking more about this in a more WebAssembly oriented thing on Friday. Uh, there's a lot to talk about. I'm going to try and condense it so we stay on time uh, and focus this on the IPLD learnings from this. All right. So what and why does this thing exist? Um, so there's two things. Uh, one, like I don't want to rewrite ADLs in all of the languages, just as like a please don't make me write this five times kind of thing. Um, and UnixFS has to be in all these places, and it's not quite in all these places yet. It's in a bunch of them getting to be more, but it, then you're like, oh, can I find someone? Is there a grant for someone to like write this and like, you know, write this in Swift? There's a really big Swift community that wants this, right? Um, and like for every one of these things, a new one. And what happens when I want to do BitTorrent or Git or like anything else? It's again, multiply the number of languages. So just like make my life a little easier. Um, bonus is that if I can write the code in a language that can import you know, FFI binary things, like Rust, C, things that are not Go, um, then I can use shared libraries, even if I don't want to use WebAssembly. Um, and I guess, uh, to back up a little, uh, things like Codex and ADLs, very useful to me, because I want to do things like make all of the file formats gettable from things like IPFS gateways. Um, we, this, th this currently supports working with codecs and ADLs. All right, what is a codec? Um, totally non-controversial, I've just taken from the website. Uh, IPLD codecs are functions that transform IPLD data model to serialized bytes, and I guess in the other way around too. Uh, so you can send and share data and transform the serialized bytes back into the IPLD data model. They look like this. Encode, data model to bytes, decode, bytes to data model. In whatever language you write, your thing will look like this if you do codex. What's the IPLD data model? Uh, it's a collection of specific of, of data types, such as these, bool, integer, bytes, list map. Um, it exists so that developers can target it as an abstraction layer without having to care about too much of the particulars, right? Um, you know, I want to look at Git or BitTorrent files and list the list the fields in them and examine them, you know, and uh, and have like a uniform tool set to work with them. Or I want to look at both JSON and Seymour maps and have a unified tooling to do with it, uh, to work with it. Um, you could argue should it support more data, more fields, more types, fewer types. Yeah, maybe quaternions should be in there. Really important for my video games that I support quaternions. Maybe not. Right now it doesn't. Um, okay, so, so what is the IPLD data model? Uh, so, so I guess to, to back up, uh, there is this thing called, uh, apparently called WAC, because I didn't know what I was doing at the time, uh, for the WebAssembly codec. It is a, a wacky experience. Uh, we will get into this. Um, this was for, for practicality reasons, both performance and working with WebAssembly, uh, and for ease of development and not wanting to write like a thousand like FFI calls, um, with also, I guess, the, the heads up. If anyone actually looks at any of the code here, which I will point to, um, it, will, it, it could be better. Uh, I learned Rust while I was doing this in like several hours a week over a couple of months. So like, you know better than me if you've written, written any Rust. Um, and so basically what I realized was that if I could use this form to describe codecs in WebAssembly, my life would be easier. Instead of coding, instead of doing data model representation to bytes and error to bytes and have to figure out what the data model means and write all the functions for that, I define a serialized data model representation. And then I let, you know, the host language do data model to serialized data model. Um, and for decode, I can take bytes and I spit them out as the serialized data model representation. And then I let the host language unpack that into however it wants to do 
data model representations? You know, do you like in 64s? Do you like in 128s? Do you like big ints? Whatever, that's the library's problem. Serialized, we are serializing the data model. Uh, which brings us to WAC, uh, which is supposed to be a concrete implementation of the data model so that encoding and decoding functions work just as they would if I was using, if I wasn't trying to serialize the data model. What is it? Um, I largely stole this format from, uh, from Michael's simple DAG uh, proposal from a while ago. Um, basically, it's like a token for the data type and then the data. So we have true, false, we have integer, we have like negative integer, we have bytes, strings, links, maps, and lists, and floats. Um, I'll go into the ones that are somewhat controversial here. Uh, I guess to back up some things that are not controversial, right? True, false, null, these seem like, you know, maybe, yeah, you know, seem like reasonable. Even integers where like the byte range isn't defined, right, in the data model, it's just like, it's an integer. We hope that your library supports up to two to the 53, which is like the number that JavaScript hath blessed, which, yeah, don't ask me why. Um, and so I've chosen to encode those as, you know, varants because they can be, they can be infinite length, right? in the serialized form. Um, and you can decide for your implementation like what's too big for you. Um, so if you read through the spec PR on this, you can notice some issues that if you've been following in the IPLD space, you might be familiar with. You might have heard of these issues before. Uh, they are, what is a string? What is a map? And what is a float? Uh, what, I'm gonna start with the last one. What is a float is, <laughs> is <laughs> right? confirmation. This, these, have been, these have been the things that when people talk about the data model, they're like, what do we do about this? And I decided to go and kick the hornet's nest for y'all and say, what if I wanted to serialize this to like force <laughs> answers? Um, yeah, you're welcome. Um, so floats. Uh, floats are sort of interesting in that like, I bet we could just like cut floats from the data model and no one would notice. Uh, because, which maybe we should do, because like they're really hard to work with serialized forms of. Um, and because like if you put them into the wrong, like the wrong base, then like you run out of bytes and then you cut things off and now your hashes don't match and like everything is very sad. Um, there are some options maybe for this, but that's, that's floats are sort of less contentious because most less people are invested in it. Uh, strings, uh, are they bytes? Are they UTF-8? Are they Unicode? Are they, what are they? Um, the data model currently says they're just bytes and that like we hope you make them nice strings. Um, Moe sort of poked at this a little bit earlier in saying that like the data model has bytes or has these strings which aren't always like nice things you can put into a, UR, into a URL that you might need to escape and then proposing an IPLD URI scheme that has escaping. Uh, and similarly, relates to the strings question, do map keys have restrictions? The data model says, yeah, they've gotta be strings. And that's sort of been the, the points of contention there. Uh, I mean, it, so the data model is a conceptual thing, right? No, no, I mean Correct, no. correct, so, correct, so that, exactly, so this is what. <laughs> oh, okay, correct, all right, so, so for, for those on the Zoom, uh, we, we are rehashing like six-year-old things, which I will boil down to you as, but, but map keys don't have any restrictions because strings are bytes and bytes can be anything. And then you say, well, but strings should be, and they say, well, but string should does not mean must, and therefore maps can in fact represent anything unless you wanna go and tweak your string definition. And so what I did was implement what is the data model, which is strings can just be bytes and therefore maps bytes. Um, it works. It's pretty, pretty easy uh, to implement in any language. I implemented it in Go, I implemented it in Rust without really understanding Rust. I bet you it would take several hours to implement in insert language of choice. Um, the most complicated part is sort of like uvarants, just because like they're not just like a byte array, but they're not that hard, their specs. If you are doing multi-formats things, you already need uvarants everywhere. 
granted, the uvarnt spec for multiformats is like capped at nine bytes, and this is not. But if you have all the code and you just like comment out the nine byte restriction, then you know you're good to go. Um, and then yeah, floats. What's an ADL? All right, from our previous talk, uh, our discussion. Um, Codex decode bytes and turn it to data model representation. ADLs take data model and spit out more data model. Um, reminder, th because the data model contains links, both my input and output can, be can effectively be like multi-block data structures that I am referring to. Right, the data model representation is one thing, but if I look at like what is the full object being represented or being talked about, it can be a multi-block data structure. Um, Bytes are part of the data model too, and so like ADLs are just a generalization of codecs to some extent. Um, if you have a block limit, anyhow, codecs can only reference so much data, and so and ADLs uh, have to try uh, and map multi-block to, to like single block, um, which means that anyone who wants to work with ADLs needs like this partial access stuff, which is just like just interfaces for working with the data. It's still a string, it's still a byte, it's, it's still byte, it's, it's still an integer. Yeah, it's an 80 exabyte large integer, and that you might only want parts of it, but like, still an integer. Um, and yeah, because we don't want to cheat and serialize the whole data model object, because that could be real, real big. Um, what are ADLs? So there is no sp specification for ADLs that we can describe like the data model. Um, Specifying helps in some places. So like in a subgraph descriptor like selectors or paths, there are things that sort of imply that an interface should be there, right? Pathing implies that I need to be able to like w do a get on a map element and walk through it, or that I need to be able to download an entire map object, right? Um, selectors also have like more expressive query parameters that also imply that you might need your implementation to support more types of functions. Um, I think this can just be an implementation specific thing until we find the need for standardizing these functions and have them sort of live in like whatever subgraph descriptors you choose or other types of abstract tooling you make will dictate what the ADL interfaces for partial things need to look like. Because like they don't need to be part of the spec. They're not. They're not a spec thing. Um, what did I do for was my PLD? Uh, only so many hours in the day. This wasn't really where a lot of them were going. So uh, I was like, "Hey, we have interfaces. What if I just copied them uh, and see where that took me?" Uh, turned out it wasn't. Didn't take very long um, in the scheme of things. Mostly me learning Rust and fighting with things like a borrow checker. Hey, that's a thing. Um, the main issues I encountered were like no parallel map, ac you couldn't get parallel map access and only iterators, um, which means like I can't enumerate all the entries in a sharded directory in parallel. This seems fixable. Um, others, others things that I didn't run into explicitly, but are there, again, from taking from the IPLD prime interfaces. Uh, only bytes have access to subranges. Um, lists don't really give me a get subrange, although you can get the indices and that's probably good enough. Strings don't, um, if you needed to get parts of them, you know, integer, if you needed like partials of any of those bigger structures, you couldn't do that. Um, lists, uh, yeah, all right, okay. So there's one other thing I guess here, which I'll just, I'll just call out briefly, uh, which is it might be useful if ADLs could take parameters, if you wanted to do things like deal with decryption and throw decryption keys in there or other sorts of stuff as is happening with like WinFS and PeerGhost. Uh, I did a case study to see like, can I like push on this a little? Uh, which is to use BitTorrent uh, in IPLD. Uh, BitTorrent is a peer-to-peer -peer data transfer protocol, uses hashes and stuff. Um, the metadata is encoded in a format called bang code. Uh, the files have names, including paths. They hash the chunks, of the, the hashes of the chunks are included in the metadata block. And this thing, is, this metadata is called an info dict, which when hashed has the clever name of info hash. Um, the goal, can I load a BitTorrent file the same way I do for UNIXFS files? 
And can I make it so that like when I do BitTorrent v2 or other things, it won't be that much extra work? All right, what, what could I use to do this? Which IPLD pieces might be appropriate or useful? Uh, I could just use raw nodes, code XR for chumps, and make a BitTorrent file or directory ADL, or like a joint BitTorrent ADL like we have for UnixFS. There's not a UnixFS file and directory, there's just UnixFS. And this works because recall that ADLs are, are just a more expressive version of codecs, right? Codecs are bytes to data model, ADLs are data model to data model, but the data model includes bytes. So I could just say raw nodes and move on with my life. Um, I could use raw nodes, but then I could have these nodes and then interpret them with a Ben code codec, right? Which would put it into sort of that standard format and give me things like look, looking at the fields and then use a BitTorrent file or you know, joint ADL. Um, and I, but I still, need sig I still need ADL signaling somewhere. Um, codecs have this signal that lives inside the CID, which is one of the reasons why people like to lean on it a little more than they like to lean on, you know, oh, I could use ADL as the same place I could use, I could use codecs, but the, there's a nice signaling place for the codecs to live, so like maybe codecs, right? Um, so question, should, should, maybe we should have a BitTorrent codec and then ADLs? Because if you do the Ben code thing, I, I need the ADL signaling to traverse the links. Because Ben code doesn't, is a format that doesn't know about CIDs. It doesn't have hash links. It's a very, very stupid format that we'll get to in a minute. Very simple, very easy to work with. Um, for what I did uh, at the moment was sort of ex exploration. I made a Ben code codec, and then a joint file directory ADL for BitTorrent v1. Uh, all right, I'll do a demo briefly. All right, I have a node. I have a koala. Yes, it's very creative. So, okay, the funniest part of all of this business is like any demo that I give for any of these things related to like the IPLD stuff in terms of reads, should all look like nothing interesting has happened, right? It's like, hey, look, it's a UnixFS koala. It's a Git koala. It's a BitTorrent v1 koala. It, like, these should all just look the same. And that's, like, the, that's the point of the exercise. Um, OK, so what do we have here? Uh, this is for, again, for, I don't know. I don't know about you guys. Uh, but I am, of course, fluent in multi-formats. And this means. Uh, <laughs> This means the Ben code, co this is a CID of the Ben code codec, which uses SHA-1, uh, which has 160 bytes. That's probably obvious to all of you, but I, I figured I'd call it out. And this is the... Uh, uh, I don't know if browsers will let me do that. Yes, I could do that. Uh, although, I don't know if it's going to have this thing. Let's find out. Aha! Bam, there it is, just works. Um, yep, yeah, so that's what it is for, for those not fluent in multi-formats. And then over here we have a selector because I did not have any of the stuff that Mob showed us earlier today. Um, and so my, my solution was let's just like chuck a selector on the end because that is, as of today, the only signaling mechanism we have that's not like the fact that this says slash IPFS in front. Right, which is the signaling mechanism, which means like, hey, try UnixFS. I swear it's going to work. Unless not, then use the data model. Right? Um, so what is this thing? Uh, this is the uh, interpret as BitTorrent v1 selector. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> This is the export as BitTorrent v1 selector. What does this mean? There was a question from the audience. Was what does this mean? Yes, Stephen. Um, so have you ever programmed an ADL? <laughs> what? In, yeah, yeah. I, 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 uh, I want to say I'm sorry for this. This is almost entirely my fault. Except it's also this person's fault right here. For those in the crowd. Uh, <laughs> a lisp. Yeah, so you just squint a little. <laughs> 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 I 
Yes. Uh, for those in the crowd, there's some comments going on about uh, what, what this format looks like and perhaps apologies that maybe this isn't the prettiest format. Or the most, um, readable. Or the most readable, given that I encoded the thing as Dag Seabor into an identity CID in order to make it easier to like shove in there. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, Eric and Steven are both sort of sorry about this. And uh, yeah. Um, yeah, if we take this back to our handy CID inspector over here, here's what we got. Shoved it in identity CID because it made my life a little easier than inventing a, uh, another escaping format to use for my selectors. Um, do I think the stuff Mo is working on is way better? Yes, I do. Uh, but this did the job. Um, yeah, and then over here, we have another friend of ours. Oh no, did I lose it? Oh no, we did, they just look the same. This is another friend of ours, also a koala. <gasps> but this one has a different, this is a different CID from this one. Uh, and its selector is different too. Uh, as you can clearly see here. <laughs> um, the, the difference is that this one is a this one is, is traversing a directory. So like okay, if we're being like a little serious here for a minute, the file one was um, I would like to basically do it do a traversal. I want to match on. I I want to I want to do it. In, I want to interpret the CID that I have as an ADL, and I would like. Once I'm done interpreting it, I would like to match on it and say, this is the thing I care about, right? So we are turning it into bytes, and then we are saying, I care about it, and the gateway is like, oh, you care about bytes. You know what looks an awful lot like bytes? Files. Files look an awful lot like bytes, and then it renders a koala for us. This one over here is a little more. It says, first I have to, before I interpret the stuff, I have to go in a little bit, I have a field, and that field is named a koala is named koala.jpg because this is a directory that actually has a panda in there too, if you look carefully. Um, and then I want to select that. And again, this is a BitTorrent v1 thing that we are traversing. So interpret as BitTorrent v1, then start traversing it. BitTorrent v1 directory, traverse to the koala.jpg. Looks like bytes. Load bytes, get koala. Very exciting, many koalas. Um, where do we go from here? Uh, so the IPLD, for the IPLD pieces of uh, WASM IPLD, um, parallel map access, nice. Uh, additional requests for ADL functionality comes in, then we expose it. Like wait for the pulls to come in and then expose more functionality on the, implement, on the WASM implement, implementation side. And uh, land this, this wax spec. Um, the, uh, yeah, uh, I, from on the IPLD side, codecs and ADLs are nice, but some guidance might be useful. Like, when do I use a codec over an ADL? Are codecs and ADLs the right abstractions? And do I need more, different ones? Um, particular ones, like that area that I was exploring about, you know, which thing do I use to, interp to create the, bit the BitTorrent codec and ADL? Like, what sequence of these things do I use, right? feels like giving people guidance on like when to use them would like alleviate the mental burden of them thinking about it because sometimes when you get people start thinking about it, they'll like oom um, and give up. Uh, and if you just tell them kind of what to do in like 90% of cases, that will, that'll do the job for them. Um, also, probably there's an extra like layer to consider here. If we, this is for files. Directories are a little more complicated. Everyone in the world agrees on like a file is bytes basically. Uh, directories are, are more complicated. You can notice this from like SHA-1 sum or SHA-2 sum or whatever. It does not work on directories because there's no like standard, this is how to hash a directory. Uh, and yeah, that's it. Uh, any questions? Yes. So you mentioned uh, that Go can't do parallel iterators uh, over the data, right? Uh, over, yes, the, the interfaces that deal with maps, you can't parallel, you know, you can't in parallel walk over the iterator because you're, you're iterating, like that's a linear process. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, but it's, it's not really a Go problem. It's the Go interface that we wrote. Yes. Go is a terrible language and has no standard concept of generic. Yeah. I, I just want to point yeah. out that if you're trying to do stuff in Rust, you can't do parallel either, which unless you do fancy stuff. You're saying just because WebAssembly parallelism is no fun. Yeah? It's single-threaded. Yeah. And I wouldn't try to go too far into parallelism. Yeah, so this is a good, so the, the comment was about like lack of parallelism in WebAssembly things. That's something, so like the other part of this talk will come on Friday and talk more about the Rust side of things. This is like, WebAssembly becomes like almost a non-starter if I cannot do parallel things. I need to be able to request blocks from the network in parallel without blocking on one of them. So come back linearly. Like li we we have linear walks in places in the Go code and the Go IPLD prime code base for for other reasons, and it it can hurt us a bunch. So, so. async versus parallel. Yeah, as long as I can dispatch out to the host to make calls, and it will come, and then and they can wait for all of them, then that's all fine. Okay. So yeah, async yeah. WebAssembly versus parallel. Correct. Yeah. So talk. Yeah, we were talking a little bit about, for those listening, talking a little bit about uh, async WebAssembly things. Probably more discussions about that later this week. Uh, I think Hannah and then Eric. Yeah, I want to jump on it. Oh, sorry. Um, this reminds me a little bit of, like, I'm thinking of the F advice is called in the Linux kernel. I don't necessarily need parallelization logically. I just want to say, I'm going to access a bunch of this data all at once. Please start getting <laughs> And if I can have something else out of band being parallel, then that's cool. We also have an idea that maybe that's what we need. We don't need yes. to parallelize anything. I just think we just have more data that we can Yes. Yeah. The more comments on, on data on ways that we can access the data patterns here so that we can like basically do concurrently be able to ask for different types of blocks and not wait on them from the network without uh, you know, different patterns for how we can do that successfully. Um, yeah. yeah, no, go ahead. Uh, one thing I, you mentioned, the, the, the fuzzy border between ADL and Kodak. Um, and you, you threw out the idea of like, well, why wouldn't I just interpret, why wouldn't the Kodak be raw and then everything is the ADL? Um, uh, aside from the fact that it's not that same point already. Why are they two separate concepts? Like, is there any case where you want an ADL that can interpret multiple serialized formats and then do the same transformation? I mean, I, like, I'm only thinking of like our current set of data. Like, do we want a Unix FS that like can be represented in C4 and JSON, but then you can apply the Unix FS transmit, you know, transformations on it? Like, is that really something? Okay, so so the so the question the question was basically I, I made a comment about how you could you could have for this and for, for other similar uh, endeavors just have like have no codex raw codex and then just ADLs uh, and that you know sometimes you want to have these things sometimes you may want these things to be reasonably coupled together uh, and so like sort of why why would you choose one or the other and I think the answer is like. I think there's room to I think there's room to discuss and explore here, but my thought is the reason we have different concepts, even if one of them is is maybe like the the mega could be like even if one concept could include another one, is that sometimes that partial piece is what's useful to you. So like as an example, there are folks who are like, I kind of wish that like I had a I I want you know a an abstraction layer that instead of spitting out, taking bytes and mapping to data model, took bytes and mapped out to set of links, right? And that is a subset of the data model. Now, does that mean that's a separate abstraction? Like, and so there's, there's maybe some use for that abstraction separately from the data model abstraction, because like maybe you don't need or want all of it. Um, and that's kind of where things go here, which is like, maybe what I want is like, I could reasonably draw a line and say, the thing that I want for Codex is I want Codex to be able to represent all of the links, and I would like as much as possible that when you run ADLs, you do not create new links. That could be like an approach I take. 
And the benefit I would get out of that is to say that, well, if you have, if it's a commonly supported codec, but the ADL is more sophisticated, then you can just pin all the, you could like request and pin and walk the graph of all the blocks that you need to touch without knowing about the ADLs. And then this starts, all of that conversation gets into like, how do I get more flexible? How do I make it more extensible to get more of these like code pieces around and how hard are they and what's the friction layer, which then leads into some other conversations around like, you know, maybe WebAssembly and things like that. Um, but looks like we are over time, just enough for new people to have arrived. So that's excellent. All right, thank you.